titled Fieldwork-Based Portrait of Climate Adaptation Around the World. So we're very lucky to have with us Rosetta, and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Phoebe. Thanks. Um, I could do something unusual and just maybe pass these around, and people can flip through them at the same time as listening. Uh, I'm Rosetta. It's very nice to be here. Is the volume OK? Um, so I'm going to do something unusual, which is what I was telling Phoebe, is that recently I've been either invited to talk about my practice or talk about plant life or talk about landscapes of retreat. And it's this kind of compartmentalizing, you know, naturally, because there's plenty to say about all three. But I'm going to try to, to talk about both books today. So if you can give me a little leeway and also some feedback, which one should go first, why, um, we can blame COVID for a lot of things, but I can blame COVID for the two books coming out at the same time. So for better or worse, that's, that's what we got. Um, and so uh, I could title the lecture as a kind of subtitle of these books, which one, of course, as Phoebe just mentioned, is on climate adaptation, and the other one is on our sort of general propensity to plant trees, specify trees, spec trees, list trees, and insert trees uh, to offset certain guilt, potentially. We'll get into that. Um, but instead, I called um, the lecture Think Little, inspired by uh, the size of some of these projects. I'm just going to move this, because I am definitely not going <coughs> to sit down. Um, the scale of afforestation. Afforestation I'll get into a little bit later, which is the word for planting trees in otherwise treeless environments. So it's very different than reforestation. Reforestation, of course, if you fell trees in a humid environment, in a temperate environment, you can feel free to put them back because the climate itself will support tree life. In what we have in a lot of the, the dry biomes of the world is um, a propensity to want to put trees in a place where they don't grow right now. Um, that is afforestation. Um, and so I call it Think Little because I am inspired by plants themselves. All of the 120,000 or so plant species that I can barely scratch the surface of. Remember, we're one species, Homo sapien, right? We're one species. There are 120,000 named plant species. Species, not like cultivar, but not even including all of the cultivar. It's as different as like a salamander and your pet dog species. And so to lump them all together all the time and to call it something as atrocious as vegetation, which is really just a mapping standard, really takes the aliveness out of one of our most charismatic and interesting design tools, design collaborations. And that is, that is the plant itself. And so I'm inspired to think little. In recently rereading Wendell Berry, for any of you who haven't picked him up, pick him up, uh, landscape students and beyond. All of his work is freely available online. For most of the history of this country, our motto, implied or spoken, has been think big. And I don't have to really read on, because you already sort of know what I mean. If something is scalable, if something can, can, can be repeated, if, if copy paste and offset are really interesting tools to you, then you know what I mean by think big. Um, but think little suggests a lot of work, a lot of effort in trying to appreciate those things that don't scale nicely. And so he's saying basically that the think big mentality means that somebody, usually very far from the problem itself, comes up with a solution, and then someone in government comes up with a plan or a law. He sort of skips over the designer, but certainly the designer is implicated in our world of solution making. The result, mostly, he says, has been the persistence of the problem and the enlargement and the enrichment of government. <clears throat> so how do we think little? That's what this essay, lengthy as it is, and I just give you a little excerpt, um, inspires me to do. And I've been thinking little for a long time. Uh, this is one of an, er, an earlier uh, publication on simply bringing attention to some of our, our, our least specified plants. Sometimes I get this question 
Like, why plants, Rosetta? We're in a multi-species world. You should be thinking about all the species. And I'll just be very blunt with you, because we're at a design school. We don't specify butterflies. They don't go on a list. You can't spec them, right? You can only create and instigate a relationship through our medium, plants. And so when you're specking soil and you're specking plants, you have to look at these lists with a lot of critical, um, hopefully, knowledge as to what's not on the list, right? So this, these installations are basically plants that are rarely in circulation in the commercial nursery market. And all I did was <laughs> bring people's attention to the fact that there's a basic supply and demand in our field. And if you ask for contract-grown plants, they will, you can start from seed and you can grow them too, which adds, of course, diversity to our environments. Starting from seeds, starting small, thinking little, inspires me. Um, I'm drawn to it every time I work with plants, which is one of the reasons I, I do. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why that matters right now uh, in the coming uh, half hour, 40 minutes, and then hopefully it will inspire you also to think little. Um, we think little at, in practice landscape, um, always leading projects by virtue of a framing between the plants we plant and the labor it takes to cultivate. And um, with a, a, a very strong sort of newer emphasis on what we're calling upkeep, which of course is a term that's already very much in circulation, but how do we upkeep or keep up with the plants around us and get away from this idea of maintenance that is much more static state uh, oriented? Um, trying to do so again with a brand new baby program. We're two years in. Um, you know, I can expound on, on, on my brave students, uh, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily the time. I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, in trying to change the professional side of how we use plants um, in order to embedder our public spaces, public realm planning, profession broadly, um, it has to start in, in our education systems. It has to start in this room. It has to start upstairs in the studio. Every time you ask a question of some steadfast measure that's been around for 20 years, that should be a red flag right away because we're in the 21st century now. And the specs and the standards from the 70s, 80s, and 90s are not only not, not only not serving us, they're doing more damage than we ever understood. So experiment in school. Um, and uh, you know, we're proudly a studio-based and land-based uh, school, or not school, uh, uh, program. And we'll see where that, where that leads us. Um, in any case, one of the other things that really inspires me about the Think Little essay is that it, it, it proposes a very simple way forward. Odd as I am sure it will appear to some, he says, I can think of no better form of personal involvement in the cure of the environment than that of gardening. A person who is growing a garden, if she is growing it organically, is improving a piece of the world. 1969. Uh, I would turn to my fellow landscape historians for a question of why the word gardening makes so many architects uncomfortable. Uh, but I think enough is enough. Uh, gardening is an active term. It's a verb. Architecture is a static term. And it is sometimes working against us. I don't think we can call it landscape architecting. So let's think about what ecology means when we use that term in landscape architecture. Because for the most part, we mean gardening. When you talk about restoring an entire salt marsh system by hand, you're gardening. You can call it restoration, but it's gardening. When you want to wipe out invasive species across the boreal forest or tackle some vine, one by one by one. You are making a decision about what belongs and what does not belong, and that is called gardening. So let's embolden ourselves a little bit to think little and to embrace the term. Because otherwise, this beautiful drawing, 
But who cares? Do you care about this drawing? Does it make you care? You know how to make this drawing. Plants get bigger. You don't have to go to grad school to learn that plants get bigger. I promise. The complications inherent in the background of this kind of drawing are what is most important now. You know this before you enter graduate school. So then take this and please experiment with us. We don't have solutions. It's not like, I mean, we, you know, to quote Paul Ferrer, who's fantastic, he says, we've moved from a pedagogy of answers to a pedagogy of questions. So we're not saying we can stand up in front of, uh, like I was taught, like Phoebe was taught, I have all the answers. Here's how to be a landscape architect, step one. No. I could teach you how to be a landscape architect, but I can't teach you how to address the changing circumstances and lands and the, 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 the droughts and the overwhelming depletions that we face. Because I don't have those answers. Who, I mean, we need to work together. And we need to work against some of the systems that have regularized what we do. Regularized it so much, in fact, that it's become problematic. I don't have to unpack why either of these images are problematic, but maybe you can. Maybe you want to spend your time as a student or your time in your career. Come in. Why don't you come in? It's not destructive. It's nice. Um, so the book, Plant Life, that's circulating around is really about this, I don't know if dichotomy is just too simple a word, but essentially we cannot deal with the deforestation across our planet by planting trees. Planting trees doesn't offset deforestation, right? You can't take down large swaths of the Amazon forest and plant individual units out of sight and out of mind and think you're in some kind of equitable relationship. But that's what we've convinced ourselves we're doing. When you go to Ikea and you take a little piece like offset your purchase, a little offset your purchase, fly somewhere, plant some trees. Are you asking what tree is being planted? By whom? What water supply it might be drawing on? What species it is? You're not asking any of those questions. And sadly, no one else is, it turns out. And if designers aren't asking those questions, if landscape architects aren't asking those questions, you know, then we're really, we're, we're missing, we're missing the beat, you know? We cannot accept this by specking this, let alone the plastic involved in the background and the poplar stake. Um, and so I take a very extreme example in the Plant Life book because sometimes you have to go to extremes to be able to sort of wake people up, right? Because if I was talking about how we spec plants in Brooklyn or in New York City with million tree planting projects, which we do, um, we can look at the atrocities of some of that work because nobody goes back to check on how many plants grow. We only want to plant them because they can be counted. Ethiopia plants two million trees in a week. Everyone's like, yes. Really? Go back, how many have survived? So if we could become a culture that grows trees, it would be different. But unfortunately, it's just a little easier to count units and kind of move on. And that's because really what I'm advocating for by writing Plant Life and certainly in Landscapes of Retreat, but it gets, it gets, a, little, it gets a little messier as our landscape does. Um, I'm advocating to grow trees because I'm advocating to reestablish relationships. And if you have a relationship with a plant and you want it to grow, then it will. It will also grow on its own, but unlikely it was planted, right? It's spontaneous. It's been moved around by other species. It's doing its thing. It doesn't need you. But if you, as a human being, decide to dig a hole in an existing part of the land, part of the planet, which is replete with other organisms, dormant seeds that are ready to be other plants, and you decide to put another tree in there, a woody plant, then you have a responsibility to that plant. And you might be able to scale that up to 10 and take care of them. And you might be able to 
take care of an orchard to some degree. Maybe it's 200, but it's definitely not 2 million. And especially in drylands where afforestation unfolds, there are very um, limited water supplies. And so if the water is going to that many trees, it's not going elsewhere. And that's, that's really what um, plant life is about. It's about three supercontinental projects. That means that they cross an entire continent. They're state-sponsored, which is what makes tree planting so political. So even when you think, okay, I'm planting a tree, that's not political. Maybe take, take a step back and think about it again. I'm sorry, it's so dry in Texas. <laughs> it, really, it really is, though. Um, and also uh, to appreciate, in, in so doing, that there are a lot of plants, woody plants are trees, so I'll just keep saying plants, that thrive in dry lands, but they have adapted for not like tens of thousands of years as we have, but for millions of years. Because plant life is much older than human life. And that's why studying evolutionary history is a basis for our history theory curriculum. We start with evolution, because if you understand plants creeping and crawling their way from our wet oceans onto these early terrestrial environments and slowly gaining height and gaining access to creating soil, you start to feel humbled at how much they've moved around the planet already. And it kind of undoes some of that, this plant was here since 1750 and therefore it should always be here discussion that is problematic also, because plants move. Darwin's last book, which he said called The Great Conundrum, because he couldn't figure out plants. His last book was called The Power of Movement in Plants. It's a fantastic book. He couldn't figure it out. But plants move all around the world, and that's how they adapt. They, and they adapt over much longer timescales than we do. And we're, we're, we're still insisting that they should be on our timescale. This is the Tak Taklimakan Desert, which is the cover of the book, which is a very inspiring plant called Populus Euphrates. Populus Euphrates evolved when it was very wet here. Most deserts used to be oceans, right? The Sahara was only an ocean 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, we had language and yeast. It's not that long ago, we being humans. In any case, it adapted over those millions of years in this environment to be a poplar, which is a species that loves water still, <clears throat> but survives in this sand sea. And the way that it survives is, which many of you are probably familiar with, through clonal growth, right? Which means that this isn't a bunch of trees, it's one organism, and it's connected underground by its root system. And so we have it all backwards when we learn plants because we learn about this individual thing like this and we put it in pots and we put it in streetscapes and we put it on an urban design plan, even a big one, and they're just offset, right? But plants want to be together because they share resources, they collaborate more than they compete. The ecology of composition, competition is a whole other story in the history of plant ecology, but plants send up these things called trees to breathe and advance their root system. They don't age them. They don't say this one's more important because it's a strong leader and this one is obviously not. They don't judge the outward form. They're not looking at the formal relationships that may or may not provide shade or resin or color to the human scurrying across the surface. They are adapting underground all the time, with or without us. And so you want a tree to live, you want a plant to live, figure out what it's doing underground. And you know that. You know that from trying to battle greenbrier or something, right? You can't just cut up some plants down and that's it. It's like, no, they're just like, okay, well, I'll just send this one up, send this one up. And yet, if, if we could study the root system, 
as landscape architects more intentionally, maybe we would end up with very different looking landscapes. Now, I am taking way too much time. Okay, so the plants of, of uh, evolutionary history are very powerful. And remember, these are all interconnected. That means they're interconnected also with when they foliate and defoliate, when herders come and don't come and need shade and don't need shade. And it's a very, very well uh, uh, adapted dance. But the plants of afforestation are powerless. but they can be counted. And they can't count the ancient clones. So I start the book with a very simple sentence. Humans are a planting species. We plant trees in the millions and billions. And uh, I tried in writing the book, in researching the book, I should say the book is the outcome of research. And I think most people here who've written books, Phoebe, I'm looking at Phoebe, you write a book at the end of figuring something out, or you write a book because you need to figure something out. You, I don't write a book because I know all this stuff that I want to put on paper, personally. It's its own design project. Um, and I was just stuck with, like, well, why do we s treat plants as objects and tools when there are other breathing organisms? And like, ha sort of, what is the history of that? And so I broke the, the, the book up into three parts. And the three uh, case studies that I use sort of fit into each, although any of them could be used in any of these operations. I just wanted to try to make it legible um, for, for a reader. Um, and that is that first we need to create an artifact out of a breathing organism. We have to take the life out of it. We have to take aliveness away from the plant Once a, and, and in order to elevate our species, right? about knowledge. We know all about this now. That's artifact. It, I go into it in, in great depth, the history um, of, our, of that knowing. Only once it's become an artifact can it actually get, of course, listed on the index of experts, experts like landscape architects who say this tree has to be here. Now, you know how many plants you don't even have to put on a list because they'll come on their own, right? Interesting. But we have the list. Foresters have a list, and only once it is so objectified through those processes can it make its way back into the landscape as an object, and that's what I'm calling trace. And then it leaves these traces, it leaves these, these marks. And um, the, this, this objectification that ultimately contours our field um, is, is based on scalability. It's based on typology, which is something we're really good at. Right, or maybe we could say is a historicized moment in landscape architecture, and we don't want to do that anymore. But first, the plant is an artifact, an individual like this. Then you can get the list. This is the African case. The African case stretches from Jakarta to Djibouti, and there's something like like 30 species on the list. Doesn't seem like enough. And then the typology. These are the grid systems they used in China in the 70s. So the scale of the operations here of deciding to tree plant Africa's Great Green Wall, I just said Jakarta, Djibouti, from Texas to the Canadian border uh, during the Plains uh, Shelter Belt Project, the state's forestry project. And um, the African one it sort of represents the uh, future of afforestation because it is a project that's basically just a committee now. A lot of money going into supporting a committee, a couple of pilot projects. But this isn't a historical book, per se. That's why I start with Africa, because it's still happening. But the Plains, uh, the, the, the first state-sponsored massive tree planting project happened here, inspired China, who's had its, uh, its tree planting program ongoing since the 70s. Um, so the Three North Shelter Belt Project is a kind of extant, ongoing Africa future, Plains past. Um, the Plains Shelter Belt Program still represents half the trees ever planted in America. I, I still stumble on that fact. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of trees. Look at the scale of what's happening in China. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with China, 
That's the scale of what's happening in China. Really? With tree planting? Obviously, there are other agendas at play, right? Obviously, there's something else going on. How can we go so far in the 21st century, in 2024, that that kind of scale is not only appropriate solution making, but winning UN CCD awards? Environmental awards. So plant life, what I argue, is rendered an artifact of botany when it appears as an index of expertise, eventually revealing the trace of planting. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more quickly. Uh, no matter what the issue, plant trees. Right? Desertification, plant trees. Dust bowl, plant trees. Air quality, plant trees. Guess what's happening now? Climate change, plant trees. Really? A century of what we call environmentalism, where our field was on the rise, it can't be that simple. I'm going to keep going because I need to keep going because I want to get to Landscapes of Retreat. By the way, till 1.20 or something, or 1.30 or 1. OK. So, so the, politi the so politicized aspect here is the Chinese project uh, in the Taklita Makan Desert. Sorry, I, have, I forgot I had this on. Um, and, and so just to give you a, a, a sense of what's happening when they get awards for tree planting, um, that is a pump station. Obviously, the tree planting effort needs water. So they're consistently pumping Paleozoic groundwater to the surface to feed these tamaracks so that the road can stay clear so they can get oil out. So that's why it's called the politics of afforestation. So these very basic questions you ask when you garden and you ask when you're a landscape architect, you ask of any tree planting project, including big landscape architecture projects like the Green New Deal. Who's planting the trees? What species are they planting? What resources are they drawing from? You would ask it as a gardener, right? So ask it of your states. Rather than dwell uh, on some of those images, which are upsetting, for sure, and I'm, gonna, I'm full of hope, so. Uh, if you study plants, you get around it. You get around it so quickly. It's so amazing. And it's in our field. Study plants. This is, OK, I haven't even gotten into the fact that miles of drip line, billions of miles of drip line in the desert Right? Pumps to make those projects happen. Turn off the pump, no more trees, right? Because they don't survive there. Most of the species are, they're, uh, they're recommending. But if you look in the background, you'll see Fairherbia, which is a plant I spend a whole chapter on, which is totally, totally inspiring. It inspires everything. Turn off the tap, all those are gone, but all dotted across the background of this, of this image are these Fairherbia. And they display reverse phonology, which is phenomenal. If you want to know a little bit more about reverse phonology, I won't tell you now. I'll ask you to read the chapter. It's freely available through your university library. All of my publications, I try very hard that everything is open access. There's a landscapesofretreat.com, the entire book, all the writing. It's all yours. Same with populace. So what I'm saying between reverse phenology and this propensity to hybridize is that to study plants now, to get away from artifact, is to study behavior, not classification. You go out there with your guidebooks and you're like, red oak, white oak, okay. But then what? You have to learn how plants behave. And once you understand that, first of all, that plants behave, then you will use them differently. You will collaborate with them differently. You will spec them differently. You will expand horticulture and ecology by virtue of behavior. I have found. Same uh, with the Ulmus, which again, you could say, well, that's China. But actually, 
This is um, a plant that was brought from China, obviously a powerful, a powerful behavior, will live through anything, uh, extreme conditions and the like, and keep going. Uh, it shouldn't say propensity to hybridize, it should say uh, uh, something about its seeding. But it is a prolific seeder, and seeder, S-E-E-D-I-N-G. Um, and it was brought and mislabeled uh, as a Chinese elm, when in fact it's a Siberian elm uh, through the Prairie States project. So some of you might know Siberian elm. It's what a lot of people would now consider an invasive species, which was of course imported from China by the federal government for the Prairie States project. For, for very, very much for its aggressive behavior. To fill in this blank spot on the map where there were no trees. You're familiar with this 100th meridian as Texans. Again, I, I really gonna, I'm gonna move a little more fast than I thought. I, I, I put two lectures together, so you gotta, maybe I shouldn't have. So uh, uh, American expansionism, go west, plant trees, really hard. That's what this slide is telling you. Um, so the federal government had to make it a little easier for people because if you know a little bit about the Timber Culture Act, basically you could own land that was stolen land if you proved how many trees you could grow on it and then reported that to the federal government. Then you could have that, have that stolen land. So planting trees, transplanting trees, dragging trees around from bottomlands up to fields was the main practice prior to the Dust Bowl. Um, and so I concentrate on the sand hills because it's where the federal government began these programs to really get plants to make scale, to make project making at the national, across national borders, um, to unite the states, if you will. So this is the first federally um, owned nursery and artificial national forest, hand planted forest in the Nebraska sand hills. So again, this tradition of planting trees and otherwise treeless environments at the state scale, at the national scale, began here. And it especially began in Nebraska with the Bessie Nursery uh, in Halsey, uh, which was of course conveniently located right next to a water source, unlike much of the sand hills, and then really promoted through the profession of forestry that started at the turn of the century. Um, and this fantastic quote, the subject matter of the profession of forestry is equally distinct from street tree planting on the one hand and landscape architecture on the other. It's nice to notice that in these days, 1905 and landscape architecture had a lot of prominence, right? 1872, Olmsted, like it's a powerful profession. It's a profession in, in, in the first three lines of this proclamation of establishing a profession called forestry. And the foresters who decided to start this thing called forestry did not begin the profession to protect forests. It began the profession to fell them, to take them down and replant them. It's good business. Take them down, plant them, take them down, plant them, take them down, plant them. And pushed, in a way, pushed designers out of that conversation. Uh, but we, that's in the book. So sand hills, uh, the great plow up of the sand hills. Uh, these are all uh, USDA public domain images. Um, but essentially, planting trees in rows to try to, you know, and you, you know prairie grasslands. You love prairie glass, grasslands, I'm told. Texas has a... Well, this is, uh, this is cutting right into that rhizomatic spread, right into those centuries of formation to put woody plant seeds in rows um, and take charge uh, of that and own it and kick everybody else out who might have used it differently, might have appreciated it differently. Um, so also to scale, it's like, okay, they did that, so they did that. That's the sand hills, right? How many, is anyone from Nebraska? You're from Nebraska. Sand hills are amazing. Okay, sand hills are amazing. But look how big they are. Look how big they are. 
So scale, that, this thing we do called scale, you know, this scalability, this, this slippery kind of, well, it's working here, so why shouldn't we make it work at the scale of, of, of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts? It's the exact same operation that China is, uh, is doing right now when it scales up in the same way that I showed you. And it scales up because of the unit, because of the artifact, the index, and then the trace. Because as soon as you have a unit and it doesn't live, breathe, or have behavior, you can just keep using it. And, uh, and so that narrowing of vision continues and continues and continues. And I think when we talk about large-scale landscape architecture projects and landscape infrastructure and productive environments and all of these other terms that are coming out and going extinct in different ways, we have to think about large-scale planting. It's in our profession. It's problematized in our world because we use the exact same techniques the exact same techniques when we buy commercial nursery stock and we don't insist on contract growing, when we insist that the tree has to be of a certain age and we can't start small, and when we ignore the, the, the most living part of the organism in our field. So do I have time to touch on this? Not really. If, yeah, a little bit. Do you want me to keep going? Okay. Um, Landscapes of Retreat was like an antidote to working on plant life. A lot of field work for both of the projects. Uh, Landscapes of Retreat, I'm just going to go a little bit faster. It uses these, these words that are very slippery. Landscape is very hard to define. You've probably read that when you've read J.B. Jackson or and Winston Spurn, or, you know, what everybody has a different way of describing landscape. I like collecting them, these definitions of landscape. You should make your own, because it doesn't, the dictionary doesn't work. Um, and retreat is a similar kind of slippery word. So I start the book by just proclaiming my, my working definitions, which I'm sure will change over the course of time, but right now. Landscape is the earth animated by multi-species activity, including layers of habitat from foundations, architecture, to footprints, humans. Retreat <clears throat> is habitation patterns, I don't use the word settlement on purpose, that meaningfully engage processes of the landscape from climate dynamics to coastal erosion, or of course, dot, 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 dot. So what retreat is, is an acknowledgement of the landscape and the risk inherent in the landscape. If you know the landscape you live with, you're more likely to decide to retreat. Let me, let me try another way. Relocation, I, uh, I, can re I can relocate this desk over there. We could relocate the architecture school by, by moving the building, right? But you can't relocate the, the, the students and the community. You, you guys have sort of, it's like infused in here that, that you're on this land, even if you don't realize it. Here's another, maybe a more spiritual example, like you can move a church, but you, you can relocate a church, but you can't relocate a congregation. Does that make sense? Okay. So architects work with relocation. Move the object. Move the building. All other living organisms, from plants to humans and in between, decide to retreat. And to treat them as not deciding organisms is to treat them as objects, like artifact, right? Is to treat them like they're movable, like you can pick them up and move them, like trees. You treat people like that, relocation schemes don't go well. So relocation has a terrible, terrible rap because, with all due respect, engineers and architects and planners pick people up and move them. And landscape architects, I hope, do not. And so I'm inspired by people that decide to retreat 
rather than projects that insist on relocation. And I tried to go out and find, and there are plenty of them, communities that understand the landscape they're living with is a little bit vulnerable in one way or another, and then come together and decide to retreat. Um, I'm just going to ask a question because I'm always curious. So is this a natural disaster? You can just nod or no. No, yeah, OK. Is this a natural disaster? This is Phragmites. Yeah, some people are yeah, some people no. Is this a natural disaster? A lot of people say Congress made the Dust Bowl, which doesn't make it much of a natural disaster. The Great Plow Up wasn't natural. Is this a natural disaster? Natural disaster? It's interesting to ask yourself these questions, right? I ask myself all the time. Natural disaster? It's a pretty one. <laughs> New York recently? Natural disaster? Natural disaster? Is the disaster that we incentivize people to build foundations and bring electricity, culverts, and pipes into a salt marsh? Is that a natural disaster? Is this a natural disaster? This is like the cover of National Geographic. It's just beautiful, isn't it? So this is happening anyways. If there was a house on this, would it be a natural disaster? This word natural is a little problematic, don't you think? This is not my proclamation. Again, Neil Smith, freely available on the web, wrote a fantastic article in 2006. What does 2006 say to you? Say it, Katrina. The denial of the naturalness of disasters is in no way a denial of natural processes. Earthquakes, tsunamis, blizzards, droughts, and hurricanes are certainly events of nature that require a knowledge of geophysics physical geography or climatology to comprehend. Whether or not a natural event is a disaster or not depends ultimately on its location. What he's basically saying is natural disasters are primarily social disasters because we have, for the most part, in the last century and beyond, but certainly in the last century, incentivized people to locate on sites, to use a term that architects like to use, or landscapes that are vulnerable and risky. And we're the ones who decide. The planners, the urban designers, the landscape architects, and the architects are the ones who try to put those same lines that are pushing through the grassland prairie on a salt marsh. And an, like, as far as I'm concerned, enough is enough. And so we have to talk about retreat. Because to just rebuild there is to pull the wool over everyone's eyes, over populations of great inequality. In any case, that's what Landscapes of Retreat is about. It's about people that recognize the risk they're in. Like they say, wow, why did I choose? A, I didn't even know I live in a salt marsh. Now I know I live in a salt marsh. I don't want to build back. And there are those communities. And we should be taking notice as designers, rather than insisting on using FEMA funds to elevate and make sacrificial floors and link causeways and the like. So going through a lot of these projects, um, again, I know a lot of you have studio and you have like things. And I'm going over. So anybody that just wants to get up and go or like make an appointment or a, an advisor meeting or whatever, just I'll just keep going, and, you, and the room will empty slowly, and we'll see what happens. Um, the condition, so my, I worked with a team of, um, of graduate students, and we were trying to figure out, you know, looking at all these case studies, is this retreat or is this relocation? Did the community have a voice? Did they not? What, how do we decide if something is retreat or relocation? And we came up with four, three definitely, and four mostly, um, conditions of retreat. And I, I bring them to you. They're in the book, of course, but I bring them to you also as hopefully an inspiration as students where you could think like that you can find cases of retreat as well. 
First, a heightened local perception of environmental degradation or ongoing risk and its negative impact on human welfare. So there's an understanding. There's an understanding. Second, an established relationship to the past within oral traditions, elders, archaeological evidence, scholarship, or experience at a number of timescales. So there's a link to the past. A degree of political organization within the community that effectively facilitates management, and thus that community has a relatively stable social organization and relies on that rather than outside intervention or, or assistance, which tends to come slow and clumsy and expensive. And that's just being able to relate to your neighbor, right? Uh, political organization can be a soccer club. It can be a congregation. It can be any number uh, of, of, of political organizations that come together because they believe in something. And that really just means that you know the name of your neighbors. And then acknowledge uh, a communal naming ritual or ceremony that begins life anew. Now, it's a bit of a poetic line, but it can be naming, renaming a park. It can be renaming a street. It can also be healing circles. Uh, it can, it, the, many, many, but a sort of a, something that catalyzes this change and acknowledges it. And so I'm going to show you two examples from the book. There are five cases, but I'm going to show you two examples because I thought they were interesting because they were both about planting. Obviously, I'm interested in plants. I don't have to say that. But these hopefully link to plant life. Maybe I do have to say that. Niji no Matsubara forest in Japan is a hand-planted forest. So remember what the f we were talking about in plant life is that there's no relationship. There is state control very, very far away with numbers and indexes and these lists. This is what you plant, and we'll ship you the plants, and you plant them. And there's that, 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 that objectification that keeps things away from designers. The sort of messiness stays away. Um, but in Niji no Matsubara, since uh, the Edo period, this community has been tending this forest. So since the 1500s, has been tending this forest. So it's absolutely a forestation. They planted trees in sand, but then they took care of them. And that's design, because you can't walk away. I mean, ev everything we do as designers is synthetic. This is synthetic. I'm not concerned about that at the afforestation scale. I'm not concerned that we're you know, changing certain ways of living. It's how we attend to that that matters. It's a beautiful place because it's such an old forest that has been tended to for so long. It is a magical place. It's about seven kilometers long. Um, anywhere from like 700 and maybe, maybe 500 to 800 meters wide, depending on where. So kind of like long and narrow. Well, not that narrow, but uh, certainly has a center, certainly has depth, certainly has regenerative capacity. These are mostly black pine, pretty much exclusively black pine. As a result, the people here, the entire village, loves black pine. It's, it's on everything. It's on receipts. It's on the packaging of things. It's on the street signs. It's on, there's just, there's just they live and breathe this plant. They, they identify with it, not only because it's such a beautiful and majestic place, but because it was handed down from all of these generations. And what you can see, if you go back to, in your mind's eye, or maybe whoever's holding the book, to that bay, the Karatsu Bay, obviously, it's almost like you can trace it, right? There was a, a tsunami, and rather than building back there, they planted a forest and they moved behind the forest as a way of commemorating that. It's pretty beautiful. It's very simple. And so the, the, you know, when you look back and a lot, like these little, you see these little pine trees on the, on the coast, it's pretty amazing. Those would be planted. Um, and they continue to plant them and care for them. Because design isn't just deciding to plant that there. It's that upkeep, right? Um, black pine is a very well-known bonsai tree, so there's also a lot of reverence and uh, certainly uh, care. 
So field work, I'm going to zoom ahead. What's important about field work is that uh, you, know, you can read a certain amount. You can read a certain amount at your desk, and then you go there. This is, I, we just had never seen anything like this in all of our research, but of course there's a map. Obviously there's a map. Um, and I'm looking at this map, and I'm like, who's this guy with the rake? You see this guy with the rake? I mean, you would never find this map sitting in your office in, you know, in Austin, but you have to go there. To some extent, you have to go there. You have to talk to people, talk to ecologists, um, you know, this little... Anyways, who's, who's, who's the guy with the rake? So not only when you, know, when you read that the, the, the town, I think they call it the village, the village takes care of the forest. This is what you'll read in literature or online or whatnot. It's so much more than that. There are lockers with shoes and extra coats and gloves. There are rakes. There are stations where anyone can go and take care of the forest. It's in, embedded in there. And they do. And they have these days where they come together. There's a little guy with the rake. And they take care of it. But ultimately, what they're doing for all those landscape architects out there is they're gardening it, aren't they? And they use all of this fantastic mulch for their tomato plants, by the way, which is also great. So this historical forest, hand-planted, incredibly gracious, a, a sort of a mark of the landscape, is also changing because plants change. So this is it's not native. It's native to Japan. This is not native to a shoreline, this plant, whatever that word means. Hopefully, you can tell my politics there. But it's an incredible cultural symbol, endured, taken care of, because of the relationship established between humans and plants. But guess what? Plants change. Because landscapes change, because climates change, because the planet is changing, because North America is still pulling away from Europe right now because of plate tectonics. This building is a meter further away from Paris than it was 150 years ago. That's what you have to learn when you learn landscape architecture, that everything is moving. And you have to use that knowledge to embolden architects and plotters. Sorry. Anyways, this is uh, a fantastic um, uh, ecologist. Uh, uh, and he uh, was my friend for two weeks. And I hopefully I will see him again one day if I ever go back. But what is happening, of course, if they do not garden the forest, care for the forest, upkeep the forest by raking away the plants they don't want, you can call it restoration. They're restoring a design. They're re restoring the design from the Edo period of the Black Forest. They are taking out locust trees that sprout up all over the place. Because, and it's not like locust trees were here when it was a beach. No, no. This is slow, slow, slow succession because of the minerals and the chemistry going on in the soil, mushrooms, all kinds of things. Slowly, this, these locust trees are coming in. And they don't identify with locust trees. Locust trees are kind of hard to identify with, especially when they're sprouting like this. They aren't majestic. They aren't evergreen. They're messy. They're virtuous. They just don't have any of the characteristics that uh, humans, are, humans there are used to. And so they're suppressing them uh, to keep the black pine pure which is also a beautiful thing to do. They've been doing that for, like I said, hundreds of years. But there is a nematode. There is a nematode and a beetle. And the nematode and the beetle are from America. Because it's not just Chinese or Japanese or Asian beetles that come to America. It's American beetles that go there, too. And this American beetle wants to take the forest down which is one of the reasons there are so many light gaps, which is why the locust is thriving. So the plants are adapting. They're moving into interesting places like 
that way west. They are, they are, they are changing. You can see, see some of the locust light at the corner here now that you look at it again, right? So the plants are adapting. The humans are not. I don't actually have a judgment on that. I'm just, I'm just saying that you can look at this and you can look back at some of your own environments and you can think like, wow, if everything is changing, the climate is changing, even if we don't want to say the word climate change, it's wetter, it's drier, it's hotter, it's uh, windier, it's you know, more destructive than ever when certain storms come, predictability is not so predictable anymore. There's all this stuff going on, but we want the plants to say the same. It's not fair. So the question Niji no Matsubara really is contending with now, which again is in none of the literature, which I was thrilled to learn about, is should this black pine forest be allowed to become a locust, black and yellow locust forest? Otherwise, you just keep injecting chemicals into every tree. And we have the same issue here. It's like, you want the invasives or you want the chemicals? But it's very, this steady state landscape that we're very used to, much as it is heartbreaking, is part of our evolution. And we could be hopeful and embrace it. In any case, I didn't expect any of that. I just expected to see the case of retreat, which was in 1500, people decided not to move back planted a forest, fantastic precedent, should share this with my community of landscape architects. So fast forward to you know, 2020, and um, this is um, a, a similar kind of floodplain environment in the gas bay. Uh, I, will, I will read this even though it's late. Ugh, it's too late. What is happening is nothing new. Everyone knows Rachel Carson. Over the long span of geologic time, the ocean waters have come in over North America many times and have again retreated into their basins, for the boundary between sea and land is the most fleeting and transitory feature of the earth, and the sea is forever repeating its encroachments upon the continents. It rises and falls like a great tide, sometimes engulfing half a continent in its flood, reluctant in its ebb, moving in rhythm, mysterious, and infinitely deliberate. I've gone back to a lot of steadfast examples of earlier landscape writing, including Wendell Berry, because I'm amazed at how much they could see and how little we're paying attention. Um, in any case, uh, here is retreat catalyzed uh, basically by a storm that I'll tell you a little bit more about, but what starts to happen is very much a landscape architectural, sorry for me going a bit quickly, but I think that's the right thing to do now. Um, a landscape architectural proposition, which is again, like, is, I mean, if, if, if this, is a, this is the widest river in the world, this is the St. Lawrence River, this is a fierce tidal river. It's not just a river, it's like something close to an ocean, as you can tell. When, when it starts to move back into its floodplain in certain moments, is that a natural disaster? Or can we so see it coming, so, so, so much so, even if it's not about settlement, if it's just about ele elevation? So uh, I worked with a benthic scientist, uh, Lad, um, Lad Johnson, and uh, he studies the benthos, the benthic, which is the bottom of the ocean, right? So the bottom of what we know, so, and he dives there every morning, incredible as that is, because it's cold. Um, and we, we worked with him because um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the river. And so when you're working with a scientist, when you're collaborating, which I'm sure you all know, you have to explain what landscape architecture is first, right? And so I'm telling him all about landscape of retreat and why we're there, and there are these people moving, and it's interesting, and da da da. And, and we're looking at a lot of these lots that have been abandoned, and he said something remarkable. He said, the landscape of retreat is the future intertidal. He studies the intertidal. He studies the benthic. So for him, all of a sudden, this is his future work, which is incredible. 
Because therefore, what we put there, what we plant there, what we design there, is going to be the bottom of that flow that one day scientists, that he's, you know, his PhD students and their PhD students will one day be studying. Now, it's a high, high tide in December, so it's, it's not easy. Um, and I did something very simple while I was there because I was inspired also by Japan, also just inspired as a, as a designer. I'm just gonna flip through some of these things. And I just, I asked the mayor, what are you doing with the land that's left behind? And it was just, pshew. oh. And that's, that's exciting because Landscapes of Retreat kind of turned into a project in this case. Um, I also put him, touch, him in touch with my friends in Japan and inspired not, um, Mr. Fortin, the mayor, because of the Japan case and vice versa, which is, is a very special, I think it's a very special thing to be able to do. In any case, uh, just giving, I mean, th I, I, this is a settled piece of land that got upset in 2010. Uh, you'll probably, see, you know, you're shaking your head, but we did just talk about Katrina. In 2010, a lot of this was catalyzed. Big chunks come off. It's winter. You've got to find shelter. It's, but everybody knows each other. It's a small enough town, et cetera, et cetera. Now, nonetheless, obviously, this in 2010 uh, catalyzed uh, uh, the federal government to do a study. We're all familiar with studies. They don't have a USGS, a kind of an Army Corps type. Canada doesn't have that, but it would be the Army Corps that comes in. And not 10 years later, 10 years, 2020, this is the map that they made. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously it was a report, so it was much more than this map. But what do you do if you're all of a sudden in the, in the constrained zone, right? Um, and that's 10 years later. So what's, but the reason I studied this, because it was prior to the report coming out, of course, is because waiting for the federal government, just, it was unnecessary. People moved. They just moved across the road. They got together, they talked about it, they figured it out, and they rebuilt across the road. Very shortly after. So 10 years later, when the report came out, they, they were laughing. That, that they were just laughing. The amount of money that they spent on that report compared to what this community did to decide to retreat. They're laughing because they're like, well, let the federal government figure out what to do with the road. But we'll take care of ourselves. And they worked together. And so we've uh, started a process of trying to value the lands that they left behind through design, making it more public, uh, and beautiful uh, because there are a lot of these lots. Again, I'll go a little bit quickly. Um, and respect for the land that's left behind after the relocation. We're transplanting plants, uh, encouraging edibles, starting from seed, uh, working with uh, local schools to collect seed, and starting very small, I'm sorry to go quickly. And basically bringing back what the intertidal was, it turned out that um, the mayor, when I, you know, he, I, well, we're gonna design something, I was like, but we don't wanna truck in all this soil. We don't want this, everything's been flattened. And he says, oh yeah, everything's been flattened because actually most of the beach pebble is in a quarry on the escarpment. I was like, what? Yeah, well, when we built the houses 100 years ago, they scraped the beaches flat and trucked them to this quarry. So there was the design, right? We don't need a drawing. It's like, truck them back, <laughs> truck it back. And we basically made them a kind of recipe book of, you know, where to place things and how to have paths through and what to seed and, and whatnot. And so as these, um, these lands go up for, again, not even talking about the whole relocation part, as people agree to move across the road and beyond, um, we're, we're just working with the, the, the mayor to to plant small, which is why you can't see many plants right now, and, um, and bring back the landscape of retreat, the respect for the land that's left behind. Whew. So that was too long, sorry. That's it. <laughs>